Pete Yost here for the Unbuild It podcast. And hey, if you're attending the PCBC in Anaheim, you got to stop by the Huber booth. Of course, PCBC is the Pacific Coast Builders Conference down in sunny Southern California. It's a great conference, been there many times over the years. The Huber booth is number 213-213. And uh, the famous or the world famous Prove It Tour trailer will be at the show. And Steve and I are presenting on strategy to process. That's you can't miss that. So join Huber for a happy hour the afternoon of Wednesday, May 24th at PCBC. It's going to be a great show, especially that happy hour at the Huber booth. Welcome to the Unbuild It podcast. I'm Jake Bruton, and today I am joined by the regular yahoos that sit at the table with me. <laughs> that would be laughing. That would be Peter Yost. Hey. Yeah, I was going to say that's the point where you go, hello. Uh, and Steve, can yeah, you say whatever. hi, Peter? <laughs> he's, he's being very directive this, yes. this episode. Hey, good morning, Unbuild It podcast. Again, in the last episode, we covered how Steve is very irritated by our listeners. <laughs> no, I like so you that. can I see his, <laughs> he just doesn't like it when they interject. Is that what it is? No, you're, I, I, oh, I have okay. to sit at the table with you two. Oh, okay. Uh, We've considered putting you in a separate room. That's right. So Q&A, question and answer. You send us questions using our email address at questions at unbuilditpodcast.com. And uh, they get sent to us by the person in charge of our website, who some of you know is Pooh Bear. Uh, and then we get the questions. And just like last time, we're going to run these uh, cold. We have not read them yet. We have not reviewed them. I might get halfway through a question and go, yeah, this is stupid. We're not reading it. So <laughs> this question is from Wes. And actually, sometimes the, we're very slow to answer these. I believe some of these in the stack are two or three months old that we haven't answered yet. This one is only like a week and a half old. So hopefully we publish this soon and Wes's question doesn't sit around for six months. So I like heard that like the, the news thing. Yeah, fresh off the presses. Unbuild it podcast. Uh, Thursday, March 2nd, 9 a.m. Jake Bruton reads West question. You're breaking the fourth wall. People are going to know how long it takes us to publish these if you tell them when we're recording it. I said 2022. Okay. Uh, how would you best use radiant barriers? Are mm -hmm. radiant barriers useful? Are they oversold in their added value? Will the vapor closed al aluminum cause unintended problems? Whew. Who wants right. to go first on this one? I defer to Pete. I so I'm going to ask you each a question to start. Well, How many of you have, have used radiant barrier never. sheathing? Yeah. Steve? Not once. No. Okay. That's probably a good thing. So let's start with what a radiant barrier is. And <coughs> it's a material that is both highly reflective to infrared energy, as well as once that energy gets absorbed, it re-radiates it very slowly. So it's low emissivity high reflectivity and it's a surface characteristic right it's all about what happens at the actual exposed surface of the material so the cool thing about putting it on the underside of the roof structural sheathing which is the most common place that it manufacturers make it for right they make it Correct. as a roof sheathing product that on the underside the interior face it has an aluminum on it exactly or a aluminum type and the idea is if the heat is coming from the outside, that when that OSB gets really, really hot, it reluctantly radiates that heat into the attic space. Why? Because it's got the high emissivity layer on it. Um, the aluminum layer. The aluminum layer. And the cool thing about doing it on the roof slope is that the biggest enemy of any radium barrier is any change to the surface like dust, you can get a micro thin film of dust and now you have a new surface and the, uh, the emissivity of the dust is like 0.9. So if it were on the flat in the attic and there were some early products that had the barrier on the floor of the attic in two months, you paid for a, a, a reflective barrier. That this is kind of cool, right? If it's on the underside of the roof sheathing, it's the low emissivity you're counting on. If you put it on the floor of the attic, as the 
heat radiates through the sheathing, it's the reflectivity of that aluminum surface that's important. So in both cases, if there's any change to the surface shininess, the whole impact goes away. Imagine that you're putting it in a most likely vented space because it doesn't do any good if it's in a closed area uh, because all that would be the same temperature or roughly the same. And it's a dirty space that has constant air that's unfiltered blowing through it. And so uh, the last part of this is one of the national labs many, many years ago did a, did a study of in what climates is this a net benefit? Because if it's a cold climate, who cares what's happening to the temperature of the sheathing or you only care during the summer months. And the rule of thumb is you've got to be at least at climate zone three or lower for there to be significant economic benefit to having a radiant barrier. So when you from zone four said you've never used it and you from zone climate zone five said you never used it, that's pretty good because it's pretty worthless unless you're in a hot climate. Um, now the same applies for if you're running ducts in unconditioned space in the attic, right? Well, they're, if they're covered with this nice shiny metal, then they are, the insulation to the interior is a conductive protection against heat loss. And the shiny metal surface is, hey, we won't, we will get reflectivity from the uh, attic uh, roof sheathing. But once again, if there's any dust on that shiny metal, that's the insulation on the ducts, you've lost that reflectivity property. And what kind of, I mean a quantifiable benefit for a product? Like, is that a, I know we talked the other day about, we don't talk about return on investment as a direct correlation for the only reason to do things. But every time I've looked at it, it looks like an expensive product. It's a premium price product. And what, what are we winning from that? You know? Well, that's, I'm writing down Pete's resource because I'm going to go back and find the DOE article where they quantified the benefit. It's, it's not, it's not 30%. It's not probably 25%. I think it's more in the 10 to 15%, you know, reduction in attic temperatures then that translates, um, uh, you know, to the benefit. And um, so then that's a 2% impact on the yeah, entire building it, it, when we're talking about small, everything. It's very, but weird. I am speaking from memory from probably 15 years ago. The last thing is any low emissivity, high reflectivity, uh, surface has to face an empty space. So for instance, there's polyiso that gets used in basements that has a white face on one side of the polyiso and a reflective on the other. And I've had clients say, well, I want the white face out in my basement. I don't want the shiny face out. Well, okay. Do you get absolutely no thermal benefit if that shiny surface is against the concrete? It has to face an empty space. So that's the rule for radiant barriers. How often does Pete just take a question and completely answer it by himself in yeah. one of these? Oh, did good, he Pete. knocked it out of the park on that. Oh. And I got a resource too. So, <clears throat> wow. This next question is from Chris G. And, you know, I made the comment about I should read the first part because that's the part I like. Love your podcast, particularly when you all stay focused. <laughs> <laughs> Quit we, jerking there's around. There's been one where we stay focused. <laughs> Quit jerking around and get to the I questions. What podcast that was? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a perfect wall for our external envelope. It manages water, air, thermal, and vapor. Generally, sure generally, our shower wall assemblies currently seem to waterproof rather than manage water. Is there a perfect wall for showers? Oh, that is awesome because I think I just took a shower this morning with a perfect wall shower, didn't I? I, aesthetically at least, I'll let you explain. You can have an aesthetic <laughs> water managed. <laughs> now I'm really confused. Okay, explain, uh, break the fourth wall. We can say that uh, Peter, Peter had a sleepover <laughs> at my house. And let me just say that Jake told his kids when I came from the morning walk that I had slept <laughs> outdoors on a bench. <laughs> they saw him walking across the front. And Jack's eyes were like, wow, he's so cool. <laughs> he said, he said, how, how did you sleep outside? Very questioning. My 10 year old was 
very interested in oh boy <laughs> uh okay so if you watch the build show if you've seen uh matt if you've been a fan of matt's uh Matt reisinger's build show channel for a while uh there's a couple different videos out about the the shower that peter stayed in uh do you want to do you want to walk uh, us through Peter the shower? Stayed in, I slept so, in the yeah, shower sorry. last night. <laughs> that, you, that you showered in. Well, it, the first time I saw that shower, I thought, there's gapped boards on the surround. So that's got to be an open joint, rain screened cladding to the shower. And I almost cried. I was so impressed with it looked great. It works great. And it's less filling. So Peter stayed at our personal house. The shower in the the guest area is a Schluter Curdy membrane, actually over drywall because that's the simplest way to have your drywallers just run everything and then do membrane over top of it, uh, unless you're going to use their their Curdy board. Uh, and then uh, we use a product made by that manufacturer called Curdy Fix, which is a sealant excuse me, slash adhesive mm -hmm. to adhere white pine strips that are three eighths of an inch in thickness to the membrane. So we have no puncture through the membrane anywhere. I did so not know that you know water here, not fast. They are adhered. Ooh. And, and then there, are, so there are no fasteners penetrating the membrane. Uh, this is just getting even more cool than I thought it was. And then we have uh, a Koya from Delta Millworks uh, that is a exterior siding product. It is uh, stained black. So the shower is black uh, that is actually adhered with the same mm -hmm. curdy fix uh, adhesive. How, how did you protect the end grain on the cut of Koya? We didn't do anything to it. Is that right? It's drying Ooh, at all times. Know. That's Maybe. so cool. I'll show you. There's uh, so where we did the uh, mixing valve, we didn't. I didn't get the math right, so I didn't stand the mixing valve off. But I also uh. didn't want things to drain down into the mixing valve. So where the mixing valve is, we cut the Akoya to three eighths thickness. It's fully adhered. It has no drying potential on the mixing valve. But the cutout in the thicker boards, the three quarter thick boards. You can even see that the underside of that cutout, we didn't stain or anything because we wanted to see how it would actually do. Wow. So there's raw wood uh, exposed in there. And then we have a gap at the bottom and a gap at the top. So we have a rain screen assembly in the shower with wood on the walls. And did you sort of spec this out or did you go to a resource or? Uh, I decided to do it when I saw the Akoya product and I was trying to figure out what to do in the shower. Well, I was just like, why this, not? This is the first one I've ever heard of is so is it typical for Schluter to say our system's so good you can do a oh, rain screen on it? They, they, I, they didn't complain when I did it. Uh, but no one there gave me permission to do it. Wow. So that's, that's, have you ever used a, a rain screen shower system? Uh, no, I cannot recollect it. You have, because you designed the house. So you, you sound get... like you're testifying right now. Yeah, I do not <laughs> I recall. Like he's, he's got like lawyers in his head right now. But now we have in the, the curdy membrane is vapor closed. So we have yeah. uh, water. Technically, we have air. Vapor. There's no need for thermal in that assembly. But we have... What you have is the real shower with a bunch of makeup in front of it. Exactly. Uh, the same as yeah, when we yeah, use zip sheathing on the outside of the house. We just yeah. use the cladding to make it look pretty and to protect it from UV and And, and the damage. conditions you get in a shower, depending on how often it gets used, it's some... I, I figured it out. Like, if three people take a shower that's 10 minutes long, it's equivalent to, like, 120 inches of rainy air. Yeah. So, it's like building in Juneau. I, yeah. I, Alaska. I haven't. I'm dying to do one where we do the same thing, where we do a real shower and then we do like a punch stainless steel panel or something mm -hmm. in front of it. So I, actually, that I should take that back. Uh, one of the uh, uh, historic house edition that we did, a very modern edition onto the historic house that's on Arrow Building's website. You can go and see it. I don't know if the, I don't think the shower's in there. We did a tile floor with the same thing. And the clients had a little outbuilding that had a corrugated metal roof. And we actually did corrugated metal oh, nice. on the, on the system. And we did, uh, we did it in a way where we actually still used, uh, screws with washers to install the corrugated metal. We just did like a one by, it might've been a, uh, 
two inch thick uh, rain screen behind it so that we could run decent sized screws into it. Cause we couldn't get really small quarter inch nut driver, washer head screws. We couldn't get them short enough to not penetrate our membrane. Yeah. And so like, yeah, it's not for everybody. I get it completely, but we had corrugated metal walls in there. And the first time the client showered in it, one of them was like, it's like we're sitting outside on yeah. the porch and it's raining on the porch roof. It's very calming. Oh, neat. And so I was the like, acoustics That's cool. Yeah. Are cool. So there's some romance. <clears throat> to this. Yeah. Um, when you started this Q and a, I was going to say never, ever put a paper faced wallboard behind any shower installation except Jake's. That's the one, because if there's no penetrations, there's no penalty for a paper faced core. Um, I, when I laid a lot of tile, I would tell people if, if you're willing to pay $5 a square foot for the ceramic tile, and then you complain about the cost of cementitious board behind it, you're, you're not really in the market for tile because why would you put a, a, a the most expensive water resistant surface and attach it to something that turns to mush? So I think the rain screen system is a lot, the forgiveness built into that with a rubber main, rubber main membrane from Schluter behind it means it doesn't really matter what you put for sheathing behind there. So uh, one of the other conversations that we're, we're going to have here, not his question, but if we're putting a watertight vapor tight membrane on the interior face of the wall and that shower has an exterior wall or another shower in the house has an exterior wall and that exterior wall has both closed cell spray foam and poly ISO on the outside of it and, or, or uh, zip R on the outside of it. Now we have the diaper scenario where the yep. wall is non permeable on both sides. This one if you look clearly has a elevation change in the wall. Uh, so the wall is not the exterior wall. There's actually a little overframe chase. So there is an uh, uninsulated space there. Uh, that on the only <clears throat> exterior wall, on the, the exterior short one wall. away from the water, away from so the, it gets the least, man, you, so that you we did don't think this, so through. that we don't just cram it in there. We have yeah. some, some opportunity if moisture does get in there to, to be able to, diffuse through smaller through other areas which which would have been a great place to put a moisture sensor which is the topic of an upcoming episode well Can't monitoring be. and the other the other thing about that one is that wall is south facing too yeah man so you've got it all we it's like the it. full monty so we have a builder that um he will always frame a two by four wall one inch off he doesn't like and it's for different reasons he doesn't like the idea of putting a cement board and <clears throat> tile on it because hmm. he's had problems where when you spray warm water on that in the morning in the winter you have basically five and a half inches where it's 30 degrees outside and now the surface of that tile is 80 degrees and just it it hmm. does wonky stuff mortar cracks and stuff he goes i just i don't like it i'll put a wall inside of it basically building a shower inside the bathroom interesting so Decouple, decoupling the, the, the shower walls, but it's only when it's on the exterior. A lot of only times, on yep. we and and because of him, I mean, a lot of designs. When I do it, I strive to put the shower on the inside walls. Anyways, does he use a sanded latex grout for the? Do you know or because I don't know because the I've switched from epoxy grouts to polyurethane because they have better um, expansion contrast expansion contraction characteristics and stain resistance and incredible stain resistance so wow i think we nailed that question we can pat ourselves on the back nailed it. we could pat each other's backs i suppose but don't touch me <laughs> pretty sure that was going to happen for those of you just listening and not watching peter is now touching steve and it's awkward for everyone <laughs> howdy guys and i don't have who this is from i'm guessing you'll know your question when you hear we'll just it just call him howdy, howdy okay greedy. howdy guys i'm a young 21 year old planning on building my own home for my wife and i with lumber i cut from my dad's sawmill i'm operating on a super tight budget but i still want to build a quality home i've been framing for about two years and come from a family with household building knowledge i'm so we're going to assume that he knows how to pr properly dry lumber and the the moisture content of lumber question doesn't exist here. Being made here. If he if he knows what he's doing and he really is going to cut two by sixes from the sawmill, we're going to count that. OK, uh, if not, 
you got to dry that stuff to a point where it's, you're not going to have issues. Uh, I'm planning on putting zip seat sheathing on two by sixes with a rain screen with Rockwell R23 between the studs and the cavity. I want to condition the attic, so I'm going to put some insulation on the slope inside uh, with Rockwell Comfort Board 80 on top of the zip uh, topped with a rain screen and a Galva metal roof. I would use Monopoly framing technique for easier air sealing. I went with two by six walls with higher insulation on the exterior oh, because it's easier for me to fit my budget by just cutting two by six instead of two by fours with my sawmill of putting exterior insulation on the whole house long story short i want to know if you think an unvented attic with rock wool exterior insulation is a good idea or should i just frame it traditionally and vent the attic i am in climate zone three hmm. glad he included that last sentence <clears throat> i'm assuming he sorry he says my wife so i assume maybe i'm making assumptions there well, so the heart of the question after all is a distraction with the lumber mill is doing an unvented roof assembly in climate zone three, where the cavity insulation. He did not specify cavity insulation on the underside. Okay. So if he only had top side in climate zone three, that's a perfect roof approach, correct? Yep. Okay. Outboard insulation, outboard insulation. You can do whatever the heck you want, basically. Right. And there are rules if you have cavity insulation about the R value between the top side insulation and the air permeable cavity. But if your cavity is zero R value, then any uh, top side, as long as it meets code for the minimum for that climate, is going to work just fine. Um, okay. So if he wants to put uh, cavity insulation in as well, what is your recommendation for air permeability for the type of insulation? And yeah. if we're going to do inside and exterior, what are our percentages? How much should we have okay. on the top side in climate zone three? So in the code, R806.5 is the section for unvented Peter, roof assemblies. Peter just brought that up without notes. I will note that he. Well, he I has 806.5 yeah. memorized. Uh, you know, what's interesting about this is that I know very few sections of the code by heart, but that is one I use a lot because I get this yeah. unvented roof assembly out question all the time across climates. But if you go to the table in that section for what level of topside R value you need compared to the R value of the cavity, climate zones one, two, and three are collapsed. So the, the, the R value relationship there is set for all three climates. I can't tell you what that is off the top of my head, but there is a value in that table. And then you're compliant with the code and you are all set. If he has any insulation in there at all. Keeping in mind that you would still need to have enough R value to meet the total required for a roof. And certainly in climate zone three, what you're most concerned about is the uh, solar gain in terms of how much R value you have. And so the uh, Jake is now, for those of you who are not doing the I just got up YouTube, and got the code book, code um, book for Peter and found in the okay. table so he could explain it. So uh, climate zones 1, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B, 3C, R5 is what you need topside for whatever the ca R cavity, R value is in the cavity. So minimum. again, one, two, three, R5 minimum. Yeah. And um, once again, if you're in mostly a cooling climate, I like the idea of having the top side air permeable insulation and some sort of uh, highly reflective roof because all what you're really fighting is not heat loss out through the assembly. It's heat gain down and in. Absorption. It, exactly. So <clears throat> the more heat you can reject off that roof, the slickest way to reject all that uh, uh, solar gain is put up PV panels. And now you've knocked the temperature of the roof down and you're getting electrons moving as well. I think Peter just uh, described the most expensive vented over roof. That you could have the most <laughs> expensive PV, PV, over. PV now, see, panels. I hadn't thought of it that way. And now I was feeling good about myself. And now I feel like a bucket head. 
<laughs> uh, okay, that's part of the repertoire at this point now, too. <laughs> okay, I think we got time for one more. We, it's going to be I a didn't quick comment on that one. That's okay. Uh, it's been a pleasure listening to the podcast. I'm a builder in British Columbia. I have very good points to be made. Working hard to improve my building quality. One aspect I'm trying to focus on is air tightness with the use of tapes and self-adhered WRBs. One thing we face in this climate is a damp sheathing for weeks on end. Tape adhesion suffers. We are regulated to mechanically fasten WRBs, which pale in comparison. Waiting for sheathing to dry out is a luxury. We don't have uh, with tight schedules i was wondering if you can suggest a damp climate type wrb which will maintain its adhesion should i clarify that i'm using a wb as the primary air barrier too thank you harpeet harpreet sorry <clears throat> i got a good one i can't wait to answer this one i'm like i spoke too much on the last one you go first how about we go fluid applied cat five it's made to be applied to surfaces that are not exactly dry it's made like as long as there's not pooling water you can roll it on a fully adhered membrane is what he's <laughs> he's looking for a fully adhered membrane let's do a fluid applied and we get a monolithic membrane it solves all the problems the only thing that is different is it's not a roll product like he's talking about that's it so just do fluid applied steve do you want to go because no, i i don't have anything to comment on oh. this one well, I'm still thinking about my comments on the last one. Good. Keep them to yourself. Hard to get away from those. Isn't it? Uh, Jake, spot on. I mean, if ever there was a call for fluid applied or liquid applied membrane, this is it. Most of the moisture cure. So the moisture content of the substrate below is actually a positive. Uh, it, it's improving the bonding characteristics of it. Uh, in fact, in really, really dry climates, they will often spritz the surface yep. of the substrate to enhance the curing uh, adhesion. So it, you couldn't pick a better one for liquid applied. The same thing. And I don't know, I'm assuming that you can get zip in British Columbia, but I don't know if you can or not. The other thing is, uh, you know, if you're working with a zip panel in that type of installation, liquid flash is kind of the same thing as the Prosco Cat 5 Fast Flash. That's a moisture cure product that if the panel is ever so slightly damp, uh, I mean, sometimes we'll spray in cold days when we know it's going to take a while to dry. We'll spritz the substrate, spread the liquid flash, and then lightly mist it again, too. And, you know, Steve and I worked <clears throat> in 2005, maybe, with Roman Haas. It was confidential work, but that's long enough to go. I guess we can talk about it. But when we told them fluid applied, I mean, uh, the big problem is going to be that it'll be vapor closed. And the lead chemist said, what do you want the va vapor permeability? I think he actually said, what do you want the vapor permeability to be? Um, I don't know what kind of accent that was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Peter does Puerto Rican, by the way. The guy that he's talking about is actually of Puerto I Rican. I started descent. out hoping it was going to be German because <laughs> it's Roman Haas, but slid into something else. Anyway, they told us we can dial in the vapor permeability to whatever you yeah. want. Yeah. They're just playing with little chemicals. Yep. So... This had a different goopy and, stuff. And the main downside of this is going to be cost. I mean, they're they're expensive. Yeah, but so are so are fully adhered sheet membranes that, that are difficult don't to work. put up that that <laughs> fall off that right. you have to wait for dry days. Yeah. Like you you gain production days if you're in as wet as what he's talking about oh. with a fluid applied. And, and, you know. And, so and just a shout out to those that build like in those places that are always wet. I was on going by a job site in Juneau, Alaska when it was pouring down rain. And I swear to God, the carpenter had holes drilled in the bottom of all of his nail pockets. He had a drainage system built into his tool belt. I thought, why don't you just not work when it's raining? And he looked at me like, oh, clearly you don't know that it rains. Yeah. 300 out of 365 days a year. Reisinger talks about uh, starting his career in D.C., I think. Hmm. Uh, with a production builder and then moving to Portland, Oregon to work for another production builder. And when he got to Portland, like the third day he was there, it started raining in the middle of the day. And like he went and got his raincoat and said, bye, everybody. And they're like, where the hell are you going? <laughs> and he's like, well, it's raining. We're going home, aren't we? And they're like, what? <laughs> like, you're not from around here, are you? Yeah. <laughs> if you look at, you know, Timmy, 
they you they everything that they wear to work seems like it's got a little waterproof layer built in. And where did Matt end up? <clears throat> not in Portland. Yeah, not in Portland. Now he's in Austin, Texas. Uh I will say are we you, got are you like a listener rather than a participant this time around? You guys are doing a good job, I don't know. Oh well, that, that's so kind of you. You could have taken the low road on that, buddy. Uh we didn't come up with it, but since we're talking about dealing with water on job sites, we didn't come up with it. I saw somebody else do it, but I've had a ton of questions when I posted a picture that had it in it. Uh, the last house we built had a tuck under garage. It was a full basement and the the lot was tight. We didn't have room for a big tool trailer. And we immediately, as soon as we sheathed the first deck, as soon as we had our Advantec down, we taped the Advantec. Uh, and then we built a temporary wall where the garage door was going to be. So we had a place to secure yeah, everything shop. that we had interior space that didn't get very much water in it. Everything felt secure and dry. And every time I posted pictures of us like framing, people are like, why the heck are you taping the, why are you zip taping the Advantech? And we were just trying to keep some water out of the basement. And it's a small house, 1700 square feet over three floors. So it was like, yeah, it cost us a hundred bucks in zip tape to do that. And then we didn't have to outload as much stuff every day. We yeah. didn't have to worry about, we could time store, saver, big time we'd saver. store materials in the, the tuck under garage at that point, those sorts of things. Very cool. Okay. So we, we still have more Q and a to go, but we're, we're, we're going to call it here for today. Uh, we want to say thank you for sending in your questions as much as Steve has a tendency to disparage our listeners and their questions. Uh, the, listeners. the rest of us enjoy your questions and we like getting questions from you. And I actually quite, I think my favorite episodes that we do are the Q and a episodes because we just it's a conversation like we would normally have if we we're eating dinner or having a beer or whatever so we can have beer <clears throat> you can have beer <laughs> peter started drinking at 11 o'clock yesterday on accident Unknowingly. on accident <laughs> that's what happens when you just grab <laughs> willy-nilly out of the office fridge at arrow building there and now people are going to go back and look at episodes when is peter like well we do we so Stay tuned. I'm sure there will be more of these Q&A uh, uh, episodes. Thank you for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for listening. If you're listening on your favorite uh, platform, don't forget to leave us a five-star review on iTunes. That drives the algorithm to make recommendations to other people. And uh, until next time, have a great day, gentlemen. Thanks for joining me. I didn't know that our listeners were on platforms. I thought they were like sitting in a chair or up on a roof. That's what happened. Well, sorry, I may have skipped something. Do we have a pizza resource? We don't, do we? Do we have a joke? Do we? No. Okay. I'm not joking. <laughs> have That's a good it. day. Bye bye. Bye.